All right. Hope you're having a great, great time today. We have a very, <laughs> very unique topic that we'll be speaking about. is uh, all about Christianity and Catholicism. Do we call it Catholicism or, yeah, Catholic Church and Christian Church? Are they really the same thing? Uh, do we worship the same God with these guys? Sometimes we get so much confused and we ask ourselves, are we really... Why is it that, uh, you know, there are some Christians who say different things and they, you know, it's like we and Catholics, they, there is a difference. I don't understand what kind of difference it is, but today I want us to dissect it uh, so that we can be able to understand what exactly do the Catholics believe and what do Christians believe and are we in the same picture? Are we in the same, uh, the same thing? Uh, because it's really very important as you believe, you also understand what am I believing? And this is going to be a very interesting, interesting, and <laughs> I may say also controversial uh, uh, learning today that you're going to learn. But uh, I'm not after the controversy, I'm after telling people the truth, because uh, the Bible tells us that the truth will set us free. Unless you know the truth, then you're still uh, deceived, you're still confused, you're still mixed up. So it's, it's not really about uh, are these people right or wrong, who is right or who is wrong. It is, it's not about that. It's basically about the true word of God, because our, our bottom line is this book. You see, Catholics, they say that they, they read the Bible, they, they use the Bible, they, they learn everything. I see them reading the Bible. But how comes... You know, there are some people who don't agree in some things. And how comes uh, some of the things that they teach are not really exactly what we see in uh, most Christians, uh, uh, you know, uh, Christian gatherings? Uh, are these people really Christians? And uh, if you're a Catholic, this is not after bashing you, it's after enlightening you so that you can uh, be able to understand and you cannot be able to open your eyes. And uh, I'm saying this with a lot of love and a lot of, you know, I've, I've done a lot of soul searching and I've really prayed and I told God, please let me not speak my words, but speak exactly what you want uh, to be spoken. So uh, our question tonight is why Catholics, uh, uh, our question tonight is basically to explain why the Catholics are not true Christians, you know and uh, to explain very well, and uh, to even tell people who think that Catholics are Christians that, man, there's something which is wrong. So let's disapprove today and say and see what the Bible says and what Catholic teaches, and uh, do your own, uh, do your own, uh, you know, uh, evaluation and see, am I going to stay there or am I going to come out? Because the Bible tells us such all scriptures, you know, such everything, prove everything. You know, the Bible tells us to prove. Proving is very important. OK, so if you're here, please, this is one of the most important videos that I've ever done. And I would like, if it's possible, please, you can share this video to so many people. If you're watching on Facebook or um, uh, you're watching on uh, YouTube, please share the video. Let, 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 let many, many, many people be able to hear and be able to understand, all right? Uh, because it's really, really important. So true Christians, they are Bible believers, you know? True Christians are Bible believers. And they believe everything to the core of what the Bible is saying. That's what makes you a Christian. And uh, the Catholic Church says there's, there, there's only one uh, thing. The Catholic say, uh, Church says that it is the only true church and uh, you cannot be saved outside uh, the Catholic Church. Like salvation is only in the Catholic Church, and they say that, you see, we are the, we are the, we are the oldest, we are the, you know, everybody came out from us and stuff like that. And uh, we're going to check today, is, are these allegations really true? And we see we have about 2 billion Catholics right now. This is the, sec the I think the first, the, the biggest religion right now that we have in the world, of course, they're followed by Islam. Uh, but the Bible tells us something here. And uh, we will start from there. Second Timothy three fifteen. Second Timothy three fifteen. It tells us. Uh, I want you to check here. Second Timothy uh, three verse fifteen. 
It tells us, and that from a child you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. From a child you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise. So what makes you wise is not traditions, is not the things that men teach us, but is the holy scriptures which make us wise unto salvation, all right, through faith. So there's faith involved, which is, of course, back again to the true gospel, which is in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, which is all about faith, believing in what Jesus did for us. And the verse 16 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, okay? So if you don't follow the scripture, then you're lacking something. You don't get the inspiration of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, okay? It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, okay? So these scriptures, we can use them to correct someone. We can use to reprove someone. We can use to, you know, to instruct in righteousness. So as we say, as I, as, as we, most people think that we're bashing Catholics. We're not about bashing them. We're about correcting them so that they can see the true light of the gospel. And uh, that's why this message is one of the most important that I've ever done. And I like you to understand this and you be able to tell even others more and even share the video more. Now, the Bible tells us that you are saved by grace through faith, okay? Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. It is not of yourselves, not of your works, lest anyone should boast. But does Catholic really teach that? that do they teach that you're saved by grace? Most of them, they teach that, uh, you see, you have to do some works. There's a couple of things that you have to do. So they try to tell you that it is through your works that you can be able to be saved. You see, you have to pray the rosary, you know, go for confessions, eat the mass thing, uh, all these kind of things that they, they try to put out there and tell you, unless you do these things, you do these works, you can never be saved. Is that really true? Is that what the Bible says? No. Now, let's come to the main point here. Now, does Catholicism and the Bible agree? Do they agree? Now, I'm going to give you several points. And if you have a pen and paper, this is something that you need to write down because it's going to be so interesting. Now, first, the reason why I believe that Catholicism has something which is not Christianity is because of their history, the Catholic Church history. Have you ever looked at the Catholic Church history? Uh, they may not say this, but when you do a, a, a thorough, uh, you know, search for history, you'll find that the Catholic Church was started by Constantine, the emperor Constantine, in uh, around uh, 325 AD, okay? This is the guy who joined the, you see, there are, there are some people who are called Paulicians, okay? If you have ever heard about Paulicians. Paulicians were hated so much by, you know, they were hated so much by the, 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 the non-believers, the pagans and all that. So because they believed and they followed what Paul was teaching. And remember, Paul is our apostle for today. And Paul tells us, follow me because I'm also following Christ. And he tells us that he's, he's the apostle for today, for the Gentiles, Romans 11, 13, okay? So they were following Paul and they were following what everything that is teaching, the blood of Jesus Christ for salvation and all that. But there are some pagan you know, pagan religions, which are really against this. And one of them was Constantine. And because he was an emperor and he really tried to block uh, the early Christians and wondering why are these people really following, you know, this doctrine of Jesus so much, he, he wanted to make, you know, Christianity a bit pagan. So to join it to the state so that he can have more power. You see, when you, when you, when you bring, um, power to the state, uh, when you bring religion with the state, then religion becomes as if it's some, some holy kind of thing. And then people fear you, not only just by you speaking, but also, you know, the whole superstition which comes with religion, you understand? So now, Constantine joined the state with Catholic, uh, with the church, and, and that was the beginning of the Catholic church, all right? He says that he saw a sign from heaven, you know, blah, 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 all that story. You can go and do your own research because I don't take much time. And also, number two, still on the Catholic history, most of the Catholic uh, people church, uh, the, the, the Catholic church believes that uh, Peter was the founder of the Catholic church. He was the first bishop. Now, 
do you really believe that Peter was the first bishop and <laughs> the Catholic bishop? Now, you see, they go to a certain verse in the, the book of Matthew 16, 18. There's a, a, a verse here, Matthew 16, verse 18, uh, where Jesus is talking. And this is the verse that they only pick that word and, you know, they stay. And they say, you see, you see, it's Peter. Now, let's look at this. Math, Matthew 16, 18 uh, to 19. And I, and I say also unto thee, this is Jesus speaking. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. All right? Now, and uh, uh, verse 19, and I will give unto thee uh, keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever shall thy lose on earth shall be loosened in heaven. Now, they say, you see, Peter is the rock upon which the church is built. Now, let me ask you, is the church of Christ built <laughs> on the foundation of Peter? Is, is Peter the foundation? Is Peter the rock? You see, I used to see in school that we are taught, what is the other name of Peter? Peter, we call him also the rock. And I was wondering, okay, I don't really get the sense. Because number one, also even this school system, they're all also trying to corrupt people as much as they can to try and remove God from, and from any place, from evolution to other things. And they try to teach you so much that Peter was a rock. Is the church founded under Peter? No. For me, what I believe is that it must have been Jesus was speaking to the uh, disciples and then he said, hey, you, Peter, because there's something probably he was speaking before to Peter. And he must have stood and say, said, hey, you, Peter, upon this rock, me, me, the rock, Jesus is the rock. I will build my church. It's not about the, the, the rock is not Peter. Now, I'll explain to you very, very well to show who the rock is. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 3. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 3 uh, to 4. It says, the, uh, Paul is talking about what happened to the children of Israel when they were leaving, uh, you know, Israel. Uh, they were leaving Egypt, going to Canaan. He says, and did all eat the same spiritual meat? and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock, listen, that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So who is the, the rock now? Is it Peter? No, the rock is Christ. <laughs> was, was Peter there in the time of Moses? No. So which rock the Bible tells us that the rock is Christ, okay? So G Jesus is the rock, is our rock, is the, is the founding stone, you know? He's the cornerstone of the church. And uh, is the, we are in the body of Christ. We are not in the body of Peter. So this is one doctrine which is being taught by the Catholic, which is purely not true. They say that Peter, the church was founded uh, uh, from Peter, and it's not really true. It's not absolutely not true true we see also in ephesians 2 18 verse 20 ephesians 2 18 verse 20 it it, it says this ephesians 2 18 uh 2 18 uh, 20 to 20 it says for through him we both have access okay by one spirit unto the father now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, all right, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Jesus himself is the cornerstone. He's the big rock at the corner of the building, okay? So it's not Peter. It's not Peter, all right? Now, let's, let's go back to that verse that they always say that uh, Peter is the rock, and let's see the context, and let's be able to see what would have Jesus been meaning all that time, okay? Let's see the context. Let's go back to uh, uh, Matthew 16, 18 to 19. Matthew, uh, Matthew 16, 18 to 19. Let's see the context. It's always good to check some, something in a much more deeper way and you see the context and you are able to say, yeah, all right, it's, it's like this. So let's start from verse 13, okay? Jesus... When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, 
who do men say that I, uh, I, the son of man, am? So Jesus is asking, who do people say I am? Who do people say I am? You see, he's talking about himself. And they said, some say uh, that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, some uh, Jeremiah, uh, or one of the prophets, okay? Or one of the prophets. He said unto them, but whom you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Yes, you guys, who do you say that I am? And of course, Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So Paul, Peter, he spoke and he said, hey, you're, you're, you're Christ, the son of the living God. So now the focus turned to uh, Peter. And now Jesus was looking at Peter and he says this, verse 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon, but Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my father, which is in heaven. Okay. And I say also unto thee that thou, <laughs> that thou art Peter, you are Peter, okay? And upon this rock will I build my church. So the focus was on Peter. Peter had just answered a question. And Jesus was answering and saying, you see, Peter, you, the Holy Spirit has told you this, it's not yourself. But you have to listen one thing, Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. Because Jesus, the, 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 the rock of ages, the rock of our salvation is the chief cornerstone. We are the, the church is built uh, on the body of Christ, not on the body of Peter. So when you hear them say that, uh, you see, it's all about Peter and Peter and Peter, uh, there's something really, really wrong. And uh, look at this. Do you remember what Jesus told Peter just in the same same sitting where they were? Do you think, <laughs> do you think the church can be, can be, you know, built? Uh, under someone who Jesus had just said this. Let, let's see. <laughs> let's see Matthew 16, 20 to 23. All right. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus as the, uh, the Christ. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes to be killed and to be raised again the third day. Then Peter, look at verse 22. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Now, who was rebuking Jesus? Peter. Do you think God <laughs> can build a church upon someone who is rebuking him? And <laughs> look at this. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him saying, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. You see why Peter was rebuking Jesus is because he was like, he did not want Jesus to die. Jesus, he was just explaining to them how the son of man will die, you know, for uh, he had not really revealed how it will be, but he had saying that the son of man will be killed and all that. But then Peter, he started rebuking him and tell him, no, it will not happen. Why? Because the devil is the one, of course, who is always telling people, no, 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 this should not be done because he wanted it not to be done for what to happen so that there's no redemption. But see what Jesus told Peter after that happened. But he turned and said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou servest not the things of God, but those that be of men. Now, Jesus calls Peter Satan. <laughs> I'm not saying Peter is bad, but at that time, Satan was speaking, you know, I'm not saying he was inside him, he was speaking and, and trying to tell him, no, no, tell Jesus he'll not be killed. And Jesus say, looks at Peter and say, get behind me, Satan. Now, do you think someone who is even Jesus calling Satan is the one who is the rock, you know, it, it doesn't add up like that. So Catholics saying that uh, the church is built under Peter, I don't think that one is the truth, okay? That absolutely is not the truth. The church was started by Jesus, of course, with the early apostles and Peter involved, of course, in the, the early preaching, but they were preaching to the Jews. If, if Even when you check, Jesus said, go not to the way of the Gentiles, just go and preach to the Jews for the, uh, when he was sending them. But later on, we see something happening, something happening whereby when Paul comes in, now the message was taken to the Jews. And if you're a Jew, you're not, a, I mean, it was taken to the Gentiles. So if you're a Gentile, you have to ask yourself, who are you following? Are you following Peter or are you following Paul? Because Paul tells us in the Bible that follow me for I also follow Christ, okay? So uh, 
I can see, uh, Tuit, you're asking me what's the relationship between Catholic and Peter. Uh, sorry, I came late. So now let me just give you a, a general uh, story, but you can check the video later on, is that the Catholic, they say that the church was started, you know, through Peter, was started, was founded under Peter, but the Bible refutes that. They call Peter the rock, and Peter was not the rock. You know, the rock is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the rock of ages, is the cornerstone of the church. What is a cornerstone? The largest rock at the corner. And uh, all that, we, we see Jesus himself, is when he was explaining, he said that when the children of Israel were crossing the Red Sea, they drank from the rock water from the rock and that rock was christ that rock was not uh, peter so and there's so much 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 more probably you can go uh, back and uh, check the video later on all right now let's continue uh number three the, there's also another thing that the catholic they say they say that uh, you see uh, peter went to rome but there's no evidence where peter ever stepped his foot in rome as a matter of fact, <laughs> the places where we see Peter stepping his foot in is a, a very weird place. Let's let's see. First Peter 5:13. First Peter 5:13. Let's see where exactly Peter went. First Peter 5. Uh, where are you? First Peter 5, verse 13. Let, let me show you where Peter went. The church that is at Babylon, this is Peter after he has written his letter. He says, the church that is at Babylon elected together with you, saluted you, and so does Marcus, my son. <laughs> Look at this. So Peter went to Babylon. He actually never even went to Rome. Who went to Rome? Paul. <laughs> Paul was in Rome, preaching in Rome. And we see all this in the epistle of, you know, Romans and, and all that. I don't need to explain about that. So them even saying that Peter was in Rome and Peter is buried be, below, you know, the the, the Vatican, that is a lie. Peter never stepped his foot in Rome. So that's a lie. That's a lie. And that one already refutes the doctrines which are taught by the Catholic Church. Number four, number four, another reason why the Catholic is not Christianity, Catholicism is not Christianity, is Peter was broke. Look at this. Peter was broke, unlike today's modern popes so if they say peter was the first pope then why was he broke have you ever looked at the catholic popes nowadays they have a lot of money they don't even know what to do with that money look at peter what he was saying look at his ministry look at him acts 3 6 the book of acts 3 verse 6 look at peter what he says here acts 3 verse 6 then peter said silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give, I give unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Peter was really broke. Now, are they really following the foundations of Peter if they really say, you know, Peter was the first pope of the Catholic Church? Why are they not broke? They are, <laughs> Vatican is one of the richest, richest, actually I hear it's worth billions and billions of dollars. So there's something not right with the Catholic Church. Another point, point number five, why the Catholic is not Christianity. Now, modern popes are supposed to be unmarried. They are sub supposed to live a celibate life without ever getting married. But Peter, who they claim he was the first pope, Peter was married. So... Why are you not following the Pope tradition if you really believe that Peter was the first Pope of the Catholic Church? Yeah. Now, Peter was married. Look at this. Matthew 8, 14. Let me show you and prove to you that Peter was married. Matthew 8, 14, it says, uh, and when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. The wife of who? Peter. <laughs> so if Peter had a wife, then why this guy is telling the other, you know, popes under Peter, under Peter, not to get married? Lies. Get away from that church. I can also confirm to you again, Luke 438. Let me show you Luke 438. Let's see. Let's see. Luke 4, verse 38. Luke 438. 
And he arose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. Simon who? Simon Peter. And Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever and they besought him for her. So the, <laughs> the mother of Simon Peter, I mean, the, the mother of Simon Peter's wife, meaning Simon Peter had a wife. And if Catholics, they say that uh, 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 Peter was the first pope, then there's something really wrong with their doctrine. They are teaching something which is not true. So are you seeing uh, those lies from the Catholic Church? Point number six, Peter refused to be worshipped. Peter, who they say, the Catholic Church, they say this was the first pope of the Catholic Church. Peter refused to be worshipped. He said, no, don't worship me. Don't bow. I'm, I'm, I'm only a man. Don't bow. <laughs> don't bow. Do we see that in today's uh, popes? Can you go, what happens the first time when you look at, uh, you know, any video, or any picture of uh, the Pope, people are kneeling and kissing his feet and kissing his hands and worshiping this guy. Look at what happened here. Peter refused to be worshipped. In the book of Acts 10, 25 to 26, the book of Acts 10, 25 to 26. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him. Now, Peter was going to preach to Cornelius. And as Peter was coming in, uh, where was Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. So Cornelius ran and he worshipped Peter. Now, look at what Peter told him. But Peter took him up saying, stand up. I myself am also a man. Is there any day you've ever seen the Pope telling someone, stand up, don't worship me. I'm only a man. Is there any day? No, these people, they love their feet to be kissed, their hands to be kissed, people to bow down on them. They are fake religious uh, leaders. And Catholicism is not Christianity. Don't be lied to, uh, by anyone. This is not what the Bible is teaching. All right? <laughs> Have you ever seen even that hat that, uh, you know, that hat that uh, the Pope wears? Have you ever seen it? The one which looks like a fish? Of course, is the, the the that that is just a representation of the Dagon fish. You know, there was a fish god from the ancient Egypt, which was called the Dagon. Just go and do your research. Go and type Dagon god. You know, in the in the in Google, and you will see that kind of god, the fish god. That's exactly what these guys are worshiping with that hat. And that that hat, there's was one of the hats that uh, the Pope wears, which is written Vicarius Fili Dei. Have you ever seen that kind of heart? Vicarious Philly Day written there. What does Vicarious Philly Day mean? It basically means in the place of God here on earth. So this guy pretends that uh, he's in the place of God. <laughs> can you see the blasphemy in this? How can you be in the place of God here on earth and you're full of sins? You're full of, you know, you're always doing, come on, you're a man. You're a man, everything that you do around you is full of sin. So how can you be in place of God? These people are blasphemous. They are blasphemous. They lie to people that they are God. They want to be worshipped, those popes, okay? Which is really, really so bad to worship a man. Don't worship a man. Worship God. So when you stay there and you say, oh, all this, it's, it's a lie. Number seven, another reason why Catholicism is not Christianity. Now, today's popes, today's popes, they demand to be called the Holy Father. Today's Pope, Pope Francis, he says, hey, call me the Holy Father. But the Bible says something different. The Bible says something different. These people say this, call me Holy Father, you know, with those, you know, big robes that they wear. Now, see what the Bible says, Matthew 23, verse 9. Matthew 23 Verse 9, do they follow this? Jesus says, and call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. So if Jesus commands and say, don't call anyone here on earth father, for there's only one father and he's in heaven, then why are you calling Pope Francis holy father? Are you not mixed up? Are you not worshiping a man? Are you not saying that the father in heaven now has come down and is wearing some, you know, some white dress and uh, it, it's a lie. Remember even Jesus himself. 
There's a time that he was praying and he was praying to the Holy Father in heaven, not the Holy Father here down. Look at this, John 17, 11. John 17, 11. John 17, verse 11, it says, and now I am no more in the world, but this are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father. This is God, Jesus praying. He says, I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, and that they may be one as we are one. So Jesus himself is praying to the Holy Father in heaven. He's not praying to some Pope down here who is calling himself Holy Father. So there's something really wrong with the Catholic Church. They are teaching something which is so off, which is not Christian-like, you know. Another point, point number eight, why Catholicism is not Christianity. Now, the Catholic Church teaches traditions, the traditions of men, and they don't teach the Bible. They say, this is how we have been doing it from ages. This is how the Catholic Church has been like. You see, these are our traditions, the traditions of the church, the traditions of the Catholic Church. They don't teach the Bible. And no wonder most of the Catholic Church people, members, they don't read the Bible. They have a way that, you know, the priest will read for them the Bible, and they will never sit down to read the scriptures. Many, many, many Catholic people, they are told, no, 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 the Father has to read for you. There are some things that you will not understand. Remember what the Bible says? Nothing in the scriptures is of any private interpretation. So if you're sitting down to wait for a father, those they call the priest, to interpret for you, mm, something is wrong with you. The Bible says, read, such, study to show thyself approved, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The Bible says that in 2 Timothy 2.15, study. Catholics, do they study the Bible? No, they're waiting every Sunday for the priest to come up with a story and give them, which is already written from Rome. The message is the same all over, written by the they are Holy Father. What if that Holy Father is a blind guy leading other blind people to, I don't know. <laughs> I'll show you by the end of this video, you'll know where they're heading. Now, look at this. They, uh, these people, they teach the traditions of men. Mark, let's, let's check the book of Mark. Mark 7, 5. Mark, uh, Mark 7, 5 to 13. Then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why walk not the disciples according to the traditions of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? You see, these Pharisees, the religious leaders, they're asking Jesus, how comes your disciples, you don't want them to follow these traditions which have already been set? Why are they not following the traditions? Why are they not washing hands as they are eating? Because these are the traditions of the religion, okay? He answered and said unto them, well, has Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites as it is written? These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They only say, Jesus here, Jesus here, but their hearts are far from me. How bait in vain do they worship me? They worship me in vain, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. They just sit down and they create some commandments, some doctrines, and they say, this, this is exactly how things will be. So uh, with the Holy Father and the Holy Priests, we have sat down and we have created these holy traditions of men, and this is what people need to follow. My friend, if you're following this big false church, you're heading the wrong way with them. Get out from this. Okay, now, again, again, uh, le let me continue there. Verse eight, for laying aside the commandments of God, you hold the traditions of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things you do. And he said unto them, full well, you reject the commandment of God. You reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own traditions. These people, they love tradition so much that they refuse the commandments of God. They say, let's do our own traditions. This, this is how we've been. This, this is how we've been. All right. Uh -huh. Verse 10. For Moses said, honor thy father and thy mother. And whosoever curses father of mother, let him die in uh, the death. But you say, if a man shall say unto his father of mother, 
It is Corban, that is to say, a gift for soever thy matters be profited by me, he shall be free. And you suffer him no more. Out for this father or his mother, listen to this, making the word of God, these people, they make the word of God of none effect through your traditions, which you have delivered and many such things you do. They create their own traditions. They create their own things that they, they say, okay, this is how we are supposed, this is how our church operates. Forget the Bible. Don't, don't, don't follow the Bible. Listen to what the, the priests are saying. You see, the priests are more educated. They, they are more learned. They have gone to, you know, for those, uh, they have been indoctrinated in those uh, camps that they, uh, that they go to, whatever. Yeah. So you see all these kind of things? And then they come and lie to you. Don't read the Bible. Do you remember a time which was called the Dark Ages? There's a time which was called the Dark Ages, uh, whereby um, the Bible was hidden from the world. There was no Bible. It was hidden. That was a time, I think it was a time from the Emperor Constantine when he came to power and he, and he made the Catholic, you know, uh, Catholic, he joined the Catholic and the state. And there was the Dark Ages. It was really so much dark <laughs> that it, it was... I don't know if it was Constantine. I don't want to quote badly, but the Dark Ages was just before the, the King James Version Bible 1611 came. Just before, I think almost about 400 years or 500 years, somewhere there. There was no Bible. It was called Dark Ages because the Bible is the light and it was hidden by the Catholic Church. And they were saying, oh, nothing, nothing. They, what the priest will read for you is what you have to believe. Nothing else. Don't read for yourself. And also I remember the Spanish Inquisition. Over 50 million people were killed by the Catholic Church. The blood of people, blood of people, just because they cannot believe, the people who refused and they say, we are saved by the blood of Jesus. We are not saved by the Catholic Church. And they were killed. They were killed, massacred, and all that. Why? Because they wanted everyone to fall into their way. But people refused. And they were killed over 50 million people. The blood of this church is in there. <laughs> and, and I will show you so much as we continue. This, this is something that you really have to hear and listen. And please, if you have a position to share the video, share it so that other people can be able to learn. This is not after views. I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not interested in the views. I'm interested in people knowing the truth so that they can come out from that and be able to be saved by the true gospel. And unless we stand... It's going to be so terrible. These people are blind. Most Catholics are really blind. They can't see. And that's why they teach, they, they start these uh, Catholic churches, you know, it's called catechism. I don't know the, the lessons that they, they teach. From when a child is young, you're taught all those kind of things so that they can indoctrinate you when you're still young. By the time you grow, you are already so indoctrinated that you cannot see, you cannot hear. The same way they do with Islam. They teach when someone is really young, they teach you and teach you and indoctrinate you so much so that you may, can never open up your eyes. You can never think outside the church of Catholic. And it's really, really so bad. And unless we stand as Christians and say the truth, people will perish. They will perish absolutely so much. So another thing, the Catholic church, to refute why they are not Christians, another thing is that they teach, if you want to be an, a church leader or a priest, you have to stay unmarried. Of course, I had spoken about that, but I want to show you proof that these are doctrines of men. And what the Bible says about people being forced into not being married, you know, through a church system. Now, the Bible says this, 1 Timothy 3, 1. 1 Timothy uh, 3, 1. Let's see what the Bible says about this. 1 Timothy 3, verses 1. To verse 5, it says about <laughs> marriage, and uh, le le let's see. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, who is a bishop? A church leader. He desires a good work, okay? A bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Now, if they say, the Bible says a bishop or a church leader must be a, a husband of one wife, and Catholic, they say, no, 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 forget the Bible. This, the Bible is lying to you. You must be celibate. Now, who is saying the truth? Would you rather believe man or would you rather believe God? The husband of one wife. 
vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Are these guys even ever sober? Have you ever seen the way those priests, they're always drinking those wines all the time and actually they, they drink in front of, the, of their church and they're always, you know, they're always high. <laughs> those cups, they're always full of, you know, they call it the, 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 the holy wine and stuff like that. You know, the Bible does not call us to be drunk. It calls us to be sober. I'm not saying drinking alcohol is bad. It's nothing which says that the drinking alcohol is bad. Drunkenness. But also the Bible warns Christians so much about against drunkenness. And these guys, they practice it in the front of their church. Of good behavior given to hospitality, up to teach, not given to wine. Now, do these people, are they given to wine? Yes, every Sunday, every Sunday. Have you ever seen this, this mess that they have? Is it mess or mass? Their mess? It's it's a total mess. They're always drunk with wine. Look, the Bible says something totally different. Totally different. No given to wine, no striker, no greedy. Or filthy lucre. Lucre is money. Filthy lucre. These people are greedy with their money. Have you ever seen the way those people, they, they collect billions and billions of money from, you know, uh, the Vatican is full of gold. Basements full of gold. They, they don't even know what to do with the money. It's one of the richest religions. Are we supposed to do that? And there are people out there in the streets. Don't even go far. In Italy, out there, there are people in the streets who are poor. They have nothing to eat. Are we called to amass wealth for ourselves? Filthy lucre? Or are we called to preach the gospel and to help the needy? So they are teaching something which is really out, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. And, and, and all that, and one which ruleth his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. You should have all your children in subjection with all gravity. So if you don't have children, the Catholic says their leader should not be married. So should we refute this one? Should we refute this one? So should we follow this Bible or should we follow the Catholic Church? Do your calculation. First Timothy 4.1. Listen to what it says. First Timothy 4.1 to around 3. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Do you know there are doctrines of devils out there? Doctrines of devils? Now let's see. What are some of these doctrines of devils that the Bible is saying? Verse 2. Speaking lies in hypocrisy having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry. That's a doctrine of devils. Catholics, they forbid people from marrying. They forbid their, 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 their priests. And that's why you're always seeing in the news all the time there, uh, you see, you hear that they're just going Google. It's full like this. Sodomy, young people being sodomized by these priests. Why? Because they are forbidden them to marry. Where, where are you going to take the feelings that God has given you? You look for those uh, altar boys and altar stuff, and uh, because you're forbidden them to marry, then you will start molesting them. Go and see this story. We have so many priests who have been molesting young uh, people. Look at, I, I don't want to mention, there are so, so many. Just go and Google search, and you see cases and cases and cases. And commanding to abstain from meats. Have you seen people being commanded by the Catholic Church to abstain from meats, especially on Fridays? Have you seen this one? On Fridays, they're told, mm, there's some Fridays you should not eat meat. Those are doctrines of devils, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So these guys, they teach doctrines of devils, and that's why you should stay away from them if you want the salvation of Jesus Christ. Now, look at something else. Why the Catholic Church is not Christianity and why you need to run away from that church. Now, the Catholics, they teach that Mary never sinned and that she was a perpetual, they call it perpetual, that she was a perpetual virgin. In short, she stayed a virgin all through. Is that really true? <laughs> That's another big lie saying that uh, Mary never sinned. Now, first, let's look at Mary never sinned. Are you sure Mary never sinned? Was she not a sinner? Let's see what the Bible says. Let's see what the Bible says. Luke 2, 22. 
Luke 2, 22. And you can uh, prepare your questions. And if you have a question, please just type it, uh, type it there and I can answer it right away, okay? Luke 2, 22. Uh, it says, let me show you. Mary was a sinner like any other person, okay? Luke 20, 22 to 22, 22 to 24. And when the days of our purification, who? Mary, according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And it is as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that opened the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law and of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So Mary went to do what? To be purified after she gave birth to Jesus it, as it was in the law. Why are you going to be purified if you're sinless? Why are you going to be purified? It means you're a sinner. So for those who say that, oh, Mary was sinless, then you have to disapprove this point and say, why was Mary going to be purified after she gave birth? Because she was a sinner. She was a sinner. All right. Now, look at this. Verse 38. Verse 38 of Luke 2, 38. It's saying, and she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spoke of, spoke of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. She knew that Jesus is the redeemer. Who is a redeemer? The one who is going to give people salvation. So she was in need of salvation. Why would she be in need of salvation and she's sinless? Ask yourself. So if you're saying that Mary was sinless, then dispute that point. Another point why uh, Catholicism is not Christianity is because Catholics believe Mary is a co-mediator with Jesus. It's like they are mediating together. You, you want your sins forgiven. You want this. You know, always pray to Mary. Tell Mary this. Tell Mary that. Mary, Mary, Mary. It's like Mary is a co-mediator with Jesus Christ. They are mediating uh, on behalf of people. Oh, let's pray to Mary. Mary, please pray to us, to God. Hey, Jesus, pray to us. You, Mary, today. Jesus, tomorrow, Mary. To Mary is not a co-mediator with Jesus Christ. Let's see what the Bible tells us. Who is the mediator here? 1 Timothy 2.5. 1 Timothy 2.5. Let's see. Let's see. 1 Timothy 2.5. What does the Bible say? For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. Did you hear the name of Mary there as a mediator? No. Mary is not a mediator. So if you're there praying to Mary to mediate for your sins, Mary, pray for us. You're only praying to nothing. You're only wasting your time. You better go and farm. Because Mary is as dead as you could ever think. And the Bible says the dead know nothing. Mary is dead. And she's, she's not, she's not a, a mediator of anyone. You see, the Catholic, they say, oh, there are these saints that we should pray to. You know, they call saints, anyone who has died for a long period of time, and you know, uh, it's believed that they did some miracle, that is who they call a saint. But the Bible says a saint is someone totally different. As a matter of fact, Paul calls us the saints to the church of this and that, to the saints, to the saints is anyone who has believed in Jesus Christ. Is a saint, but for them, they say there's some people who are called saint, saint this and that, because they died a long time ago, and they did one, two, three miracles, which we hear, we are not even sure, because we are not even there. This is what they call the saints. And now they can pray to these saints to pray to them. Saint John, please pray for us. Saint Mother, Saint Lucia, Saint what? Come on, how can a dead person pray for you? There's only one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. And so if you're sitting there and praying to these uh, idols, and uh, have you ever gone to a Catholic church and you think you're in a museum? You think you're in a museum? Have you ever gone there? You enter in the door and idols everywhere, idols from the door to the last place is full of idols. It looks like Babylon. 
And actually, this place is a Babylon. It's full of idols. Jesus, Mary, Joseph, who, 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 so many pictures. And the Bible tells us, do not make any graven image. Do not bow on any image. And you, you go and say, ah, you see, I'm just praying to this Jesus who is like this on that cross so that I can concentrate. Those are lies, man. You're, you're, you're praying to idols. Those are idols. Get away from those idols if you want to live. Pray to the one true God. God said, do not make any image of me. Don't pray. Don't create anything and bow uh, bow before it because it's an abomination. Don't do it. It's in the, the Ten Commandments. And look at the Ten Commandments of the Catholic Church. They change the commandments. There is no do not make idols. They remove that. Why? Because they want people to worship idols. Because they are a false church. They are lost. And they need the Savior for salvation. So if you're a Catholic church, please get away from that. If you're a Catholic and look for the true salvation, which is only found in Jesus Christ. Stop believing in these things. And if you have anything to refute what I'm saying, please give us your comment and give us your Bible verse down there. And if you're liking this sermon as I'm, as I'm talking about it, please share to many people so that they can watch and so that they can hear. It's not about the views. It's about opening the, the eyes of the people so that they can understand and so that they can come out from that because many will be led to hell. Think about it. You stay in church all your life from since when you're small, from catechism classes and everything till you die. And after you die, you go to hell. My friend, you rather could have just been a normal guy or an, any other thing. Why waste all your time? Give to the church. You're trying to be so good and so holy. And at the end of the day, Jesus comes and you don't see the rapture because it's going to happen. The rapture is going to happen and people will be scared. They will not, they'll be like, their hearts, the Bible says, men's hearts will fail. Men's hearts will fail because of fear. They will fear. What has just happened? The, ma many will be saying, these conspiracy theorists, eh, Keith and the other guys, they were always telling us these things. And uh, we always thought they are conspiracy theorists. They always said, there's nothing as bad as one day waking up and say, oh, oh. the people that we really thought they were conspiracy theorists, they are the ones who are really telling us the truth. We are really doomed. Please get out away from that church. It will mess up you and everything. Now, let's see another thing. There's something that I left that Mary, they say, the Catholic church, they say that Mary had no other children except Jesus and she remained a virgin. Is it really true that Mary had no other children, that she remained a virgin, the perpetual virgin Mary. That's what they call her. She's a perpetual, like endless virgin all through. If, if she was a virgin all through, then uh, about seven children plus might have, must have been born by the power of the Holy Spirit. Then I think I really pity Joseph who married a, a wife and never even gets to have time with her. Oh, it's really poor, poor Joseph. You marry someone and you'll never have a relation with her. You're just like, oh, okay, one child after another. Because we see Mary had over seven children. Now, let me show you, including Jesus. Matthew 1, 25. Matthew 1, 25. Let's see. Matthew 1, verse 25. Matthew 1, 25. Listen to this. And he knew her not. The Bible is talking about uh, Joseph. He's saying, and he, he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. So Joseph knew his wife, Mary, not. He did not know her. He did not sleep with her until, until he has given uh, the firstborn, uh, he has bore, he bore, she bore the firstborn child and named him Jesus. So the word, he knew him not until. What does the word until? It means after that, something happened. So it means he had relations with her. And that, uh, of course, something happened and that she gave birth to other children. Now, let's see. Did she give birth to other children? Let's uh, confirm this one, 100%. Matthew 13 55, Matthew 13, 55, Matthew 13, 55. Let's see. 
Did Mary have any other children? Now listen to this. Is not this the carpenter's son? He's talking about Jesus. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters? They Are they not all with us? Whence then has this man all these things? Now listen, those are the brothers of Jesus. He had brothers. Listen, how many? We know Jesus, of course. Uh, it's saying, and his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters, not sister. So meaning at least two sisters. So that already means seven children Mary had. Unless this one could have been the biggest miracle. A woman gives birth to seven children and she's still a virgin. Then it could have been even a greater miracle than just Jesus being, uh, you know, being born from a virgin woman. It could have been a greatest miracle. So if you're there and you're saying that, hey, Mary was a virgin until she was a perpetual virgin, then you're lost and you're blind and you need Jesus to open up your eyes. Get away from this religion. It's only mixing you up and lying to you, okay? We can even see in uh, Galatians 1.19, Galatians 1.19, what did Paul say concerning, you know, did Jesus really have a brother? Did Jesus really have a brother? What did Paul say? In Galatians 1.19, Paul is saying, uh, but of but other of the apostles, I saw none. He's saying after uh, him coming up to Jerusalem. But other of the apostles, I saw none, save James, the Lord's brother. So James, have you seen the same story? James? James was the Lord's brother, Jesus' brother. So Jesus had brothers and sisters. So Mary never remained a virgin. So that's a lie. Another lie refuted, okay? Uh, broken down. Now, let's see another lie why Catholicism is not Christianity and why you need to get away from it. Now, Catholics, they teach that the mass, I, want, I love to call it mess, <laughs> the mess or the mass, that uh, they teach that they pull Jesus from heaven and they put it in that, you know, that bread. I don't know what it's called, that, that they call that small bread. And they, it's like they pull Jesus and put him there. And then when they eat that bread, they are literally eating Jesus. That's what they believe. Is, is, is it really true? Is it really true? The Bible says, what does the Bible say concerning <laughs> the flesh? This, you know, let's look at John 6, 63. John 6, 63. John 6, verses 63. It says, Mm, it is a spirit that quickens. It is a spirit. Spiritual things is the one which matter. The flesh profiteth nothing. So as they are pulling this thing and eating and saying, oh, I've been forgiven my sins. And uh, I think with this thing that they eat every day, they're always, they, it's, it's like a feast every Sunday. Have you ever gone to a Catholic church and you see these people? They look so holy and, you know, give me one or Someday they put the, the father, you know, the, the priest, he puts it in their mouths. Others, they, they, they hold it like this as if, you know, it's like, oh, I'm holding the body of Christ. No, the Bible says here, the Bible says here, it is a spirit that quickens. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. It is the word of God, which is life. This thing that you're holding and, and you're so much scared about this and you say, oh, I don't want you to. No, you're only holding a piece of bread. Just come on. When Jesus said, this is my body, do it in my remembrance. He did not say literally that you're eating the body. No, he said, this is, this is something to remind you, to remind you of what Jesus did for us. But it's not even, I, I, I don't know how to explain this, but it profits you nothing to eat those things every Sunday. And you're thinking that you're eating the body of Christ so that you can be forgiven. We are not forgiven by eating a piece of bread. We are not forgiven by drinking some cup. And I wonder, I've never seen Catholics drinking the cup. It's only the priest who drinks the cup. How comes? 
how comes it's only the people they are giving the body but where is the blood it's like they are denying the blood they say no oh, forget the blood <laughs> let the priest drink the blood uh, you just eat the body eat the hebrews 10 10 to 12 hebrews 10 10 to 12 hebrews 10 uh 10 to 12 let me show you something which will really shock you because this day these guys they are eating that every Sunday and they think I'm forgiven every time that I eat that bread, that Eucharist, or I don't know, they call it water. Anytime that the, the priest gives me this thing during the mass and I eat it is I'm being forgiven over and over again. No, 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 no. Look at this. Uh, Hebrews 10, 10. It says by the, which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. Jesus died once and is not going to die any other day. He died once, only once. So if you kill Jesus every day, every Sunday you're killing Jesus, then uh, something is really, really wrong. He died once. And verse 11, and every priest, <laughs> does that not sound like Catholic? And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Have you seen those priests? Every Sunday, they are lining people in a straight line. Please pick this up. Let's kill Jesus again at the cross. Let's eat him. Let it, let's sacrifice Jesus again. Give him the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice, which man? Jesus. One sacrifice for sins forever. Sat down on the right hand of God. Jesus offered once and that was it. So every day you're eating that thing and you're saying, Oh, we are killing Jesus. It's like we are being forgiven over and over again. Then in the first place, you've never been, been forgiven because you've never even understood salvation. All right. Now, <laughs> look at this. Catholics, they, they're always thinking that they, 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 they're doing the same thing over and over again. But let me, let, me, let me look at who? Let me look at Peter. The one that they try to say that he was the first pope. Let's see what Peter says concerning if Peter was really their first pope. What was what did he say about you know sacrificing Jesus and forgiveness of sins? Did he say that we do it every day? Now let's see. First Peter three eighteen. First Peter three verse eighteen. <clears throat> three eighteen. It says, "For Christ also has suffered for sins, the just for the unjust." that he might bring us to God, being put to, get, to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Now, look at that. Has once suffered. Jesus did not suffer twice or thrice, or it's like every Sunday, Jesus is suffering again. You're, you're killing him again at the cross. No, Peter says he suffered once and forgave you your sin. The only thing now you need to do is to believe, to trust and once you believe, once you trust, then all these other things, uh, stop doing the messes. Those mess or mass, they just have nothing to help you with, all right? Of course, Hebrews 10, 14, it says it's by one offering that we are forgiven. Now, there are so many things that we don't, the Christians and the Catholics, they don't match. And they prove 100% that these people they have something else that they are worshiping, which is not God, because they are totally against the Bible, against the doctrines of God, and they are to the doctrines of devils, like we have seen, doctrines of devils. Now, let's look at another thing that which refutes the Catholics and which divides, makes a big line between the Catholics and the Christians. And to show you that Catholics are not Christians, let me show you this. <clears throat> Uh, the Bible wants us against a particular person, a particular, you know, kind of persons. Now, let's see what the Bible wants us about. And let's see, does it really look like this, guys? There's some people that the Bible wants us against. Luke, the book of Luke 20. Luke, uh, where are you? Luke, Luke 20. I want to show you. The Bible warns us and tells us, stay away from this kind of people. Luke 20, 46 uh, to 47. See, the kind of people Jesus tells us to stay away from. He says, beware of the scribes which desire to walk in long robes uh, and love greetings in the markets 
and the high seats in the synagogues and the chief rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses and for show make long prayers, the same shall receive greater damnation. Do you see what the Bible is telling us? Beware of people who wear long robes. They wear long robes and love greetings in the marketplace and the high seats in the synagogues, you know, in the synagogues, they love the high seats and the chief rooms are the feasts. When they are eating, they are the chief rooms and they devour widows' houses and show and make long prayers all the time. Uh, have you ever gone to those, whenever those guys are doing their mess, it's always a total mess, long prayers, but it's purely rituals. There is no prayer there. Now, have you ever seen these priests who are always wearing those long dresses? And they, and they are there telling you, call me father. And you're wearing a dress. What kind of confusion? You're wearing like a woman and you tell people to call your father? <laughs> you, people must really be confused. How can a woman or a man or, you know, it's the same agenda. The same agenda of trying to make men women and women men. And why would you wear those things? Be a man. The Bible says do not cross dress and it's written in the laws. Don't wear those things which are for women, let them be for women. And those which are for men, let them be for men. And men don't wear, you know, don't mix up yourselves. God is not the author of confusion. So if you're there, you're believing uh, these guys, then you're really lost. You're really lost. Another thing, why Catholics are not Christians. Now, Catholics, they love repetitions, repetition, repetitive prayers. Have you ever seen this kind of prayers that they do? Repetitions. There's something that they call the rosary, praying the rosary. It's uh, like this earphones here. And uh, it's, it's some, something kind of like this. And they tell you, you know, as you pray, pray, you pray one, two, three, four, five, say 10 Hail Marys. Uh, five holy fathers, this and this and this, and they pray uh, over and over. It's have you ever gone? Just go on YouTube and check what is how to pray the rosary. You'll see a lot of repetitions. Uh, our, our Father, what in heaven? Uh, our Father, what in heaven? Hail Mary, full of grace. Hail Mary. Repetitions, pure repetitions. Do you think God is a robot? You think God is a robot where you go and press one switch and then? Hail Mary, I said five. Hail Mary, six. Hail Mary. Now, let's see what the Bible says concerning repetitions. Matthew 6, verse 7. Matthew 6, verse 7. What does the Bible say is concerning repetitions? Matthew 6, verse 7. It says this. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be hard for their much speaking. They think they will be hard for speaking a lot. Hail Mary, for our blessing, our Father, what in heaven, and they're praying those things. They think because I've prayed 20 Hail Marys today, I'll be hard because of my much repetitions. No. <laughs> Jesus says, don't, don't think I love repetition. I love prayers from the heart. I love people who seek me diligently in truth and in spirit. You can say one word and the Holy Spirit, God has heard. Because the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit prays for us. Sometimes when you're really down and we don't even know what to say, he knows uh, through our groanings, he knows what we want to say. And he will even pray for us. Sometimes you can even say only one word and you see God answering. It's not the vain repetitions of the Catholic Church they do, which are going to make God hear. Nothing, nothing. Because verse 8 says, be not therefore like unto them, like these people. For your father knoweth what things you have need of, even before you ask him. He knows. He knows. So why would you repeat to him like a button? How would you feel if your child comes every day? Dad, I need a pen. 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 Dad, today I need a, a, a geometrical set. I need a geometrical set. You'll tell him, please, I've had. Why are you making no? Why are you giving me these repetitions? God, the Bible says God has a heart. He can feel. He can understand. And he says, come, let us reason together. 
When he says, let's reason together, what does he mean? He says, speak to me, man to man, let's reason together. Don't give me repetitions. That's exactly what the, what the Catholics, they say. And if you're a Catholic, man, just go back to the starting of this video and rewatch it over and over again and show it to other people. Let it sink to your mind and go and prove if these things that I'm saying are true. Be a Berean. There was a church. There are, the, there are some Jews who are from a place called Berean. And it says in, uh, in Acts 14.11, I think 14.11 or 14.17, it says the Bereans, the Jews from Bereans, they were of a noble character. And every day they searched diligently to see everything that Paul has told them. Is it really true? So be a Berean today. Go and see all these things that Keith is saying. Are they really true? Are we really deceived? Is the Catholic Church pretending that there, you know, there is no other salvation apart from the Catholic Church? And is it really true? Curiosity. Go and read it. Go and read it and prove it yourselves that these things are not so. Okay. Now, another thing which makes the Catholic Church is just a bunch of lies. Is because the Bible warns. The Bible warns, and it says something. The Bible tells us to come out of her, my people. Now, who is that her? Have you ever realized and asked yourself, who is that her? Which church or which organization or which religion or which, which group of people, they are always after a mother something, a mother figure. Do you know about Notre Dame? Do you know about our lady of something? Our, our mother, our mother, this and that. They always talk about mother this, mother that. God is not a mother. God is a he. Our father in heaven. But these guys, they're always after our mother. Our mother this, our mother church, our mother this, Notre Dame, mother, mother. Now let's hear what the Bible tells us about this mother kind of figure. Revelation 18, 1, Revelation 18, verse 1. Let's see what the Bible says. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. Okay. And he cried mightily. This is an angel crying in the last days, in the end times, in the time of revelation, crying, saying, he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils. Babylon the great is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils. And the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful blood, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wine. Have you seen those wines in the Catholic Church? Have you seen them? Is that not a representation or something? You're going to understand after this. The wine of the wrath of our fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of our delicacies. And I had another voice come from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of our sins, that you receive not her plagues, because there are some plagues which are coming. And the Bible says, come out of her, my people, come out of her. This one, <laughs> she will fall. Yeah, For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Now, let's check very well. How many things, if you check the history, <clears throat> the history of the Catholic Church, how many things have been done by the Catholic Church, which are really an abomination to God? One, murder. There's been a lot of murder in the Catholic Church. Just go and research the Spanish Inquisition. Man, Spanish Inquisition, over 50 million people were killed by the Catholic Church just because they could not agree that the Catholic Church does not save. And they say, no, 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 we are saved by the blood of Jesus. No, you say it's Catholic which saves you. And they were killed. The Spanish Inquisition of 50 million people, they were killed for their faith. They refused to cooperate with this church. And I thank God nowadays we, we have a little bit of freedom before uh, Christian persecution starts again in the end times. And that we can speak these things. And I tell you, people, come out of her. Let's see something else. In Revelation 17, 1, it tells us exactly the identity of this her, of these people. 
It tells us the identity. And from this, you'll be able to see who is the Bible talking about. Let's see. Revelation 17 verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talking with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show to thee the judgment of the great whole. This woman, the judgment. Let me show you the judgment of the great whole that sitteth upon many waters. Look at that word. Do you know where Vatican sits? <laughs> it's surrounded by water. Look at Vatican. You are going to believe this. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of our fornication. Every Sunday, these guys are th with that wine. Is, it, is that cup probably meaning something? I don't know why they're always drinking with that cup every Sunday. Let's check verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon scarlet colored beasts, full of names of blasphemy, having seven he heads and ten horns. Which kind of people are full of blasphemy? Have you seen the way the Catholic, they are blaspheming God? They say, call me Holy Father. I am God. I am God. No, no, come and bow down. Bow down unto me. Worship me. Vicarious Philly Day in place of Christ here on earth. They say, no, I am Christ. Follow me. Worship me. Blasphemies. Blasphemies. Verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. Now look at that. Are those not uh, what the, most of these priests they wear in the Catholic Church? Purple and scarlet color? Why would the Bible tell us about this? Think about any other people who wear this. Most of these people, they wear this. And a decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Mm -hmm. Having a golden cup in her hand, full of abomination and filthiness of her fornication. Man, I don't know if this verse can explain even much more, but look at that. Purple and scarlet. Decked with gold and whatever, all those kind of things. He's saying gold and the precious stones and pearls. Have you ever seen the way the Pope is decked with a lot of gold everywhere? And the time that he's holding this, you know, the, the, the sun, you know, the sun god that they worship, which is uh, like this. And he's holding them. I have so many photos about that. Uh, you can search even full of gold and all those kind of things, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abomination, holding this. And verse 5, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. She's the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with blood of the saints. Which saints? Remember what I've told you? The Spanish Inquisition, 50 million true Christians were murdered by the Catholic Church. History is there everywhere. It says exactly that. And we have to say it as it is. With the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, those who refused to worship the Catholic Church. And the, when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. I was like, whoops. And the angel said unto me, wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carried her, which has the seven heads and ten horns. So John the Revelator is told, why are you wondering? I will show you the mystery. I will explain to you who she is. Now listen to this. The beast that you saw was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. You see where these guys are coming from, bottomless pit, and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wander and whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was and is not and is and is whatever. Yeah. Look at verse nine. And here is the mind which has wisdom. Now, John is being told, if you have wisdom, look at this. If you have wisdom, this is it. This is exactly opening to make you understand who this woman is. Let me show you. The seven heads that are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Seven mountains. Mm. If you just Google right now, go to Google and you check the city on seven hills. <laughs> you will see Rome. <laughs> Rome is anciently from all the days is called the city on seven hills. Look at that. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. 
Rome, that Vatican there, sits on seven mountains. Actually, there is literal seven mountains around. Go and check. And just look at verse 18. I don't want to go much. Verse 18 says, the woman which you saw is, is that great city, the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Which other, other country or which other place in the world right now is called a city? No, it's only the Vatican City. So do your math. Calculate. Tell, ask yourself, am I going to stay there? Am I going to stay there? Or am I going to open up my eyes to the true gospel? Or am I going to be lost by the, the same way people are lost? And people don't want to hear the truth nowadays. People will say, we'll, people will rather read a whole novel, finish up a novel of, uh, I don't know how many pages, but never read the Bible. They say, no, I don't want to read the Bible. I don't want to hear the gospel. I'd rather believe in fables and lies than someone who is telling me the truth. It's okay. Life is yours, uh, do as, uh, as you may want. But remember, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, judgment. Now, another thing which refutes uh, the Catholic from Christians, divides the Catholics from the Christians, and uh, confirms to you that the Catholics are not Christians, is because Catholics can never know if they are saved until they die. Absolutely. They cannot tell you that, I, I am sure 100% I'm going to heaven. Just stop one Catholic one day and ask him, hey, brother, are you 101% that you're going to heaven? Are you sure that you're going to heaven? Most of them will tell you, um, you know, you cannot really know until you die. You know, you, you can't really understand if you're going to heaven until you die. Then if you're in something that you don't even know if you're going to heaven, then why waste your time there? Why waste your time there and you don't even know where you're going? It's just like Islam. They will, they will never tell you where they're going. They'll say, ah, you will know when you die. If uh, maybe your good works uh, surpass the bad works, you know, uh, probably God can have mercy on you and, uh, you know, something can happen. Catholics, they say this. Th this. They say that, uh, you know, you know uh, their, 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 their religion is based on works. You have to do a couple of things. It's not based on faith. It's works. It's a religion of works. You see, you have to pray the rosary. You have to eat the, uh, the mass. You have to, you know, do confessions. You have to do this and that. There are a couple of things which are said there. And you have to fulfill all this and try and do and be good and try this and this and this and this. They are not saved by grace. They are not saved by just believing in Jesus Christ. No, they are saved by these works, these works that they do. And after these works, they usually told, mm, if you die, having done all these works, uh, when you die, you're going to purgatory. And, uh, you know, purgatory, they believe that you go and you burn a little bit. You burn, burn. It's like you're cleansing your sins. It's like hell, but not really hell. My friend, it's a pure hell. And when you get in there, you will never get out. If you're there and you're Catholic and you go to that purgatory, that small hell, my friend, you'll never get out from it. You'll, and, and they say, when you, you've died and you're in purgatory, now the prayers of the people, as they pray to you here, those who are alive, and they're praying to you every day, they're praying and praying, their prayers, <coughs> their prayers, excuse me, they will make you who has died to continue coming out from purgatory slowly, slowly, until one day uh, uh, God will have mercy on you and then you'll come out from purgatory. Is that what the Bible teaches? No. No, because this Catholic church is just about after money. The more the masses, the more you pay to the priest and they come to do a lot of masses in your home after you've died and they do great masses, big ones, and they call, you know, the, the father of all the fathers. And you see, if you don't give a lot, of, uh, a lot of money in the church, they will, you know, they will say, probably they can even say the church, church boy is the one who's going <laughs> to bury you. They, they are levels. Eh? If you're a... If you're a giver, then uh, the bigger priests will come for your burial. If you're not, uh, you know, you give less, then uh, you have no hope, my friend. Uh, it, it will take you so long before you come out from purgatory. That's what they, so the more the masses, the more you pay this priest to come for the masses, the more, you know, it will quicken you to get it. So it basically means you can pay your way to heaven. No, these guys are liars. They are liars. It's all about the money. It's all about the money. It's nothing. Because the Bible tells us, if you're a Christian and you know you're saved, 
The Bible tells us, and you believed this Bible, it tells us this, these scriptures will make you wise to know first what is salvation. And once you know the salvation, what salvation is, then you will not be fooled. You will absolutely know where you're heading. Let me show you 2 Timothy 3.15. Let's see what it says. 2 Timothy 3.15. It says, uh, 2 Timothy 3.15, and that from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. This book, this Bible is able to make you wise to understand where am I heading? Am I heading to heaven or am I heading to hell? So you will not be mixed up. You'll not be confused. It's able to make you wise. And once you get the knowledge of the truth, Wisdom comes from God. The truth is found in God. Once you know the truth from God and you get to believe the truth, then the truth sets you free. And after you're set free, then something happens. You are able to know that you're saved. And you know 100% that you're going to heaven. The way I know 100% I'm going to heaven because I believed the Bible. And if everything which is in this Bible is true, then I know I'm going to heaven. Why? Because I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible. And the same should be with you. So if your religion teaches you that you can't know where you're going, then it's really a pity. Let's see. I, can you really know that you're going to heaven? First John 5.13. First John 5.13. It says, these things, these things which are in this Bible, these things I have written unto you, that believes on the name of the son of God, that you may know, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may believe on the name of the son of God. So if you read these things which are written in this Bible and you believe in them, you know that you have eternal life. You know that you're heading to heaven and that you will not go to hell because the Bible has promised you and it has told you where you're going. If you believe the things which are written here, not if you believe the traditions of men. Are you seeing the difference? So how can you truly know and how can you truly be saved? You see, there are people who have just realized and they're saying, what? I didn't know Catholic was like this. I didn't really understand. And I really thank God for, for, for you. I, I'm not here after bashing you. I'm not here after showing you how foolish you are, but I'm after here to show you the truth so that you may be saved, that you may be changed and that you may not go to hell, that you go to heaven. Don't go to hell believing in something which the Bible did not say, what Jesus did not say, believing in traditions of men. Please don't. So you may ask, so how can I be saved? How can I know? How can I be saved and know that I'm going to heaven? It's a very simple thing. Very absolutely simple thing. Let's look at Ephesians. Ephesians 1.13. What does Ephesians 1.13 tell us? in whom you also trusted. It says there's someone that you need to trust, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth. So it says there's someone that you need to trust after you hear the word of truth. So what is this truth that we have to hear? The gospel of your salvation. Oh, there's a gospel that we need to hear so that we can trust in this person. In whom also after that you believed. So we have to hear some gospel and then we believe it. And then what happens after you believe? You are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Oh, so you hear, you believe, and then you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is sealed inside you. So why is the Holy Spirit supposed to be sealed inside you? What is the importance of the Holy Spirit staying sealed inside you? which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession and to the praise of his glory. Oh, so the Holy Spirit is the earnest, is the assurance of our inheritance that we will inherit something in heaven, that we are children of God, that we have an inheritance in heaven, that we are saved. So this is the earnest of our inheritance until redemption. So when he's inside you, he will stay there and give you a surety that you are a child of God until the redemption, until you're redeemed from this corrupt body. So what is redemption? Redemption is basically until the day you will be changed and your body will be glorified, you'll be given another body and taken to heaven when Jesus comes. So now we have been told that there's something that we need to hear, which is called the gospel, so that we can trust 
We believe in it. And then after we trust, we are sealed. So now let's see, what is that gospel? The gospel is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And the gospel says this. This is Paul saying, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. So Paul tells us, this is the gospel that I'm declaring to you. This is how you're saved. Look, which I preached unto you. Now he's saying, this gospel I preached unto you some time back. And of course, he has been preaching all through. Which I preached unto you, which you received. So you have to receive the gospel. You have to receive the gospel. You have to understand it and receive it, okay? Which you have received and wherein you stand. So you're not standing on your works like the way the Catholic, they stand on their works. They stand on confessions. They stand on eating mass. They stand on praying the rosary. They say, because I prayed the rosary, I ate the mass. I did confessions. I'm standing on this so that I can be saved. This one gives me guarantee of salvation. No, you're standing in the gospel. It's a very different thing from what uh, the Catholic are saying and what the Bible is saying here. Which also you have received and wherein you stand, okay? By which also you are saved. So you are saved by this gospel. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you're believed in vain. So you have to keep this gospel in memory unless you're believing in vain, believing in vanity. You're believing that because I did confessions, because I went to church so many times, because I, 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 I did all these things that are written here and all the things that the Catholic, they try to say do. Because I did those things, I think I'm going to heaven. No, you're believing in vain. He says, keep the gospel in memory. So how do you keep something in memory? The only way you can keep something in memory is by understanding it, okay? Unless you understand what is this gospel, you can never put it in memory. Remember, the Pharisees, they were the teachers of the law. They were the most religious leaders in the, in the, in the, uh, on that time. But they never understood the gospel. They never understood that this is Jesus, the one that we have been reading in the Bible. Why? Because they never kept it in memory. They never understood. They were just reading and cramming is different from understanding. Remember when you were in school, the teacher used to tell you, understand the formula don't cram the formula so that it can be here and the moment you understand something it comes from your mind to your heart so i always tell people there are people who will miss heaven because of only 18 inches where you kept the gospel others they knew the gospel from their head but it was never in their hearts because they have never understood it they have never digested it and understood it all right let's continue Verse 3, for I deliver unto you first of all that which I also received. So Paul is not giving us his own story. He also received it. According to Galatians 1.11, he says that this gospel was not from man, but it was given to me by Jesus Christ. It was a revelation by Jesus Christ. So he's saying, I also uh, uh, received it. How that Christ died for our sins. Oh, so the gospel is how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That is the gospel. So if the gospel is how Christ died, then let's ask ourselves, how did Jesus die then? Jesus died by shedding his blood. He shed all blood from his pipes, you know, from his veins. He shed everything until he started shedding water. So through this shedding of blood, what is really important? Why did he have to shed the blood? Because the Bible says, without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. There is no re remission of sins. Unless there is shedding of blood, there can never be forgiveness of sins. So we have to ask ourselves, uh-huh. So then, why is the blood so important like this to God? Because God gave a command and he said that the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given you the blood to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that atones for the soul. So through the blood, because the blood is where life is. And God said, whosoever will sin, he must die. And God is not man that he can repent. He can never change that. God is holy and he cannot stay where there is sin. So whoever sins, he must die. So what happened? He said that whoever will sin, he must die. And he says, life is in the blood. So how do you die? By removing the blood. So if you remove the blood, then it means that animal or that creature has died. 
And then we see all through Genesis and every other time, there was blood which was always being shed to cover people's sins. In the time of Moses, the time of Cain and Abel, there was blood, blood, blood. And then you ask, why was the blood really important? Because that blood meant if this animal is dying, then it has shed the blood. Then I trust this blood the, as if it was my blood for the forgiveness of my sins. And remember when Jesus came and he was coming to be baptized, what did John the Baptist say? When he saw Jesus coming there, he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There he is, the Lamb of God. Why did John the Baptist call Jesus the Lamb of God? Because Jesus was coming to be slaughtered like a lamb. And through his precious blood that he would shed, we would, it will be as if it is us who are being killed and our blood is coming out. But it will be through his blood, if we trust that blood that Jesus is shedding, then we would get forgiveness of sins. It will be that Jesus has died, he has shed his blood for you at that cross. So if you believe that the blood that Jesus has shed was for you, for your sins, then you're saved. That's why the Bible says the gospel, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So this blood is the power. So anybody who tells you go to Jesus or go to, I mean, go to God in heaven, through any other means apart from the blood is lying to you and is giving you a doctrine of devil. And that's exactly why most of these churches which say, just do this, do this and you'll go to heaven. They are lying to you because unless you believed the blood of Jesus, Romans 3.25 says, in whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Unless the only way you can have your sins covered is through the blood of Jesus Christ, believing in the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood is very important. Look at Ephesians 1, 7. It says, in whom we have redemption through his blood. We are redeemed because of his blood. Him shedding his blood. Okay? Through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. He gave us the blood to atone for our sins. And if we trust that blood that Jesus shed, we are trusting the gospel. The gospel is all about how Jesus died, shedding his blood at the cross for the forgiveness of sins and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So if you believe that Jesus died, he was buried. I mean, Jesus died for our sins. He did not die for nothing. He died for our sins. If you just believe Jesus died and rose again, everybody believes, even the, 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 the you know, the atheist, uh, um, I don't know. Everybody knows that there was a guy called Jesus and he died at the cross. Does it mean they are saved? No. But only if you believe that he died for your sins. He was a replacement for you. He replaced you. You are supposed to be on that cross saving yourself. And that's why after the rapture happens, you'll not be able to be saved by Jesus' blood. Now you will save yourself by your own blood. You will have to die for your own sins because now the grace will have gone. The time of the grace will have left. Now it's this, we are living at a very beautiful time where you are saved only by believing, having faith, believe in Jesus that he died for you and you're saved. And as you confess, because many people always go to the book of Romans and they say, you see, if I've said something, I've opened my mouth and said uh, this and this and this. Am I not saved because I repeated that prayer? I said the sinner's prayer. Am I not saved? Look at what the Bible says here. All right. Uh, Romans uh, 10 verse 9. It says that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So people go there and they say, just confess this and you'll be saved. They have not even understood the gospel. Now, can you confess something that you don't know? Can you go to a court and say, I want to confess those murderers, but you don't know. You don't know them. You don't know the story. How will you confess what you don't know? For it is, the Bible says, uh, 
verse 10, for with the heart that man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So you, you, you know, you believe from your heart for righteousness. And after that, you can confess and say, Jesus Christ, I know you have died for my sins. I know that you did this for me. And I know, and I know absolutely that you died for my sins. And I accept what you did for me. I accept the blood atonement that you atoned for me. And I believe in you. And I believe that you never died in vain. And this day, I put all my trust in you. I don't put my trust in my things. I won't put my trust in my money. I don't put my trust in the things that I've done. I don't put my trust in baptisms. I don't put my trust in, in uh, confessions. I don't put my trust in it. I put all my trust in the blood that you shed, that that blood which you shed, it was for me. A good example. Think about it. Your house is about to be locked because of rent arrears. And you tell me, Keith, please help me. Please pay for me. Please, 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 please. My house is being locked. And then I tell you, okay, it's okay. I've listened. I've listened. I know you have rent arrears. Just go to the bank and the sign and accept. I've already paid. Just go and accept and say, the payment was done for me. And then you keep on saying, no, Keith, I'm not really sure if you really did this for me. Please, please, please help me. Please, You keep on telling me, help me, help me. Please save me from this. My house not to be closed. Save me. I just be looking at you and saying, but I already paid it. You just need to go and sign and accept. Just go and accept, my friend. Why are you bothering me with calls and telling me to save you, with, you know, to help you? Go and accept. And if you don't go there and accept and just say, I have received, I have accepted this payment. Your house will be locked. And at the end of the day, you'll be chased out. And that's exactly how salvation is. The debt of sin was paid at the cross when Jesus said, it is finished. He already finished it. He paid the sin for everyone, for Hitler, for whatever, all those people who have killed others and all the bad people. He paid the sin for everyone. The only reason which is making you not get salvation is because you have never believed. You have never accepted the payment of salvation. And unless you accept, you can never be saved. So salvation is all about believing, believing, believing that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and rose again, according to the scriptures. And if you believe that, my friend, you're going straight to heaven. So guys, I hope this has been a blessing to you. I hope you have been able to learn something. Please share this video to other people. Share to as many people as you can. Let them hear the word. Don't think about the, I'm, I'm not after views. I always say that. Don't think you're doing Keith a favor, sending something. No. Or I mean, se sending the, the message. You're only helping others who are blind so that they can open up their eyes. Please share the video. Let other people be able to know what is ailing them and that they can come out of these things and that they can believe the true doctrine of Jesus Christ for the remission of their souls. Because rapture is coming, my friends, so, so soon. And it will be so much of a pity that you've been in church all your days and you're left behind. Please wake up. Wake up. See you on Monday. God blessing. Uh, God willing. Uh, with God's blessings, I'll see you on Monday, same time, with another great message. Thank you.